The purpose of this research to show lens deceptions experienced in all observations of the Earth's luminous outer sky surface from stratosphere darkness and from other land areas of the universe. It was also intended to indicate the lens deceptions resulting from telescopic observation of luminous celestial areas. Though the drawing was made prior to any confirming photographs of stratosphere ascension or rocket flights, it may now be viewed as reality because of the V2 rocket photographic confirmation since October 1946. The land area, as indicated at the bottom of the drawing, represents the accustomed location in our observation of the familiar blue sky between New York City and Chicago. In looking up or out from such land positions or from any other land position of the Earth, we observe the blue sky of varying depth or density from time to time and from place to place. The sharp horizontal curves are never experienced with such sharp angles. The abrupt termination of the horizon is here required to complete the illustration. It imposes lines of demarcation between the various land communities. It also permits simultaneous view of inner and outer sky curvature. The outer are to be observed only from stratosphere darkness and from other land areas of the universe. The region between represents the seven to 10 mile distance from land to blue sky. The distance varies over the earth and over the universe whole. Inhabitants of other land areas of the universe can view no other blue sky than their own. They cannot see our immediate blue sky, but they do see our outer sky surface as we see their outer sky surface. At night, they view our sky's outer surface areas, and every sky area, as here depicted, is luminous and deceptively globular. Hence, the deceptive globularity imposes the appearance of isolation. Accordingly, our terrestrial area appears to other inhabitants of the universe as the same isolated stars and planets as their areas appear to our observation. Our sky areas make their heavens above, as their sky areas make our heavens above. The dark area of the illustration above the sky areas represents the stratosphere, which extends indefinitely. As it encroaches upon terrestrial sky areas, it likewise exists over all other sky areas of the universe. The luminous and disc-like outer sky areas show how the gaseous blue sky of terrestrial land observation becomes luminous against the dark stratosphere. The lens detecting such luminous areas, which we definitely know are not globular and isolated, is compelled by its function to create the curves that produce the luminous disk areas as illustrated. Each disk area must, as previously explained, impose that further illusion of a body. The celestial bodies of astronomy are precisely what the illustration describes. Hence, from a distance, we see the illustration's luminous disk-like areas as true disk surfaces, Likewise, do we observe luminous celestial sky surface areas, the so-called stars and planets of astronomical assumption, and inhabitants of celestial land areas view luminous areas of our sky in precisely the same manner as we observe luminous areas of their sky. In sharing our lens illusions, as they must, they manner that we have been deprived of physical journey to their land. Since the drawing could have no purpose if the complete disks were shown, it portrays only half disks or a series of luminous arcs. That is all that is really required, inasmuch as that alone is what the most powerful telescopes are able to detect throughout the universe. If the lower blue sky areas of the illustration were obscured, as one held the illustration at arm's length and observed from the top of the page, one would discern that any area shown would appear as a disk from distant observation. As explained earlier, when the deceptive lens formed disk area is detected, the mind automatically supplies the fullness, which completes the disk and imposes the delusion of a globe body. Every luminous outer sky area of the Earth and the universe about the Earth must, through lens function, and only thereby be detected as a disk-like area illustratively presented, and it is then assumed to be a globe, and the illusory globe must appear to be isolated. It should be understood that every luminous arc or disk-like sky area, as illustrated, possesses width as well as length. Since there are nine luminous sky areas in the distance or length of stratosphere course from New York City to Chicago, each area should be considered approximately 111 miles in diameter to make the approximate thousand miles between New York City and Chicago. It may be considered that in the flight machine photographing that sky course, there will be a lens of sufficient power to embrace an area 111 miles wide. Accordingly, 
As this particular stratosphere journey to Chicago extends in north and northwesterly direction, there would be photographed nine luminous globular and isolated bodies on the direct course. And photographs made at an angle to the direct course would show numerous other luminous rounded and isolated bodies, their number depending on stratosphere altitude and camera lens power, plus the photographing angle. The intensity of gaseous sky content prevailing at the time of photographing would likewise influence the number of bodies to be detected by the camera lens. The group arrangement of figure four is intended to convey how every luminous terrestrial sky area would appear. But such a necessary illustrative grouping of sky areas does not permit the luminous sky areas to be separated or isolated as they will appear from distant observation. It should be understood that when observed individually, the luminous curving down of each depicted sky area causes it deceptively to appear separated and isolated as a distinct unit or body. No lens can detect and record more than one of the luminous disk areas at a given time. That feature, as previously shown, was proved by the camera lens. As previously shown, was proved by the U.S. Navy's rocket camera photographs of luminous terrestrial sky areas over White Sands, New Mexico, and adjacent territory. As the illustration's thousand-mile photographing experiment is in progress from New York City to Chicago, other similar experiments over the sky of corresponding thousand-mile areas can be moving in the stratosphere from Los Angeles and from Montreal, London, Berlin, Moscow, and Rome. They would all be procuring identical photographs over their respective luminous sky areas. There could be variation in the quality and the quantity of light shading and distortion in some photographs over different sky areas. If the cameras of the different photographing expeditions possessed varying lens power, that would result in there being more or less luminous and isolated terrestrial sky area globes photographed over different routes. However, if the same lens power is utilized in all cameras over all routes, and if the same altitude is maintained, the photographic results will be approximately the same. The qualification approximately is in order, because conditions prevailing at the time of photographing some thousand mile areas would vary with conditions prevailing elsewhere and with those of the thousand mile area from which the numerical standard was developed. Gaseous condition of the various luminous sky areas could influence detection or mitigate against the possibility of detecting certain sky areas. The photographing angle would also contribute to numerical finding. Thus, at this point, one may have acquired some vague concept of the deceptive isolated terrestrial universe that our luminous outer sky areas present to all observers from beyond the Earth. One needs but briefly consider the number of luminous isolated globe to be detected over a single thousand mile area of the Earth's entire luminous outer sky surface. Naturally, the number of isolated globe to be detected can be expected to vary depending upon the lens power, restricting angles of lens focus, and conditions existing at various terrestrial sky areas. In the latter consideration, Stratosphere elements and gaseous sky content and expression would be factors. It is reasonable to assume that a lens with greater power will embrace a wider terrestrial sky area than a weaker lens can. But the more powerful lens cannot detect as many isolated globes over a restricted sky area because of the fact that, by embracing a larger sky area, there will be an overlapping of the more numerous areas to be detected by the weaker lens. Where the weaker lens might show 20 or more isolated sky areas and 100 miles of sky surface, the stronger lens might be expected to detect only 10 or 12 or even fewer. However, the numbers here used are meaningless other than for comparison. No numerical accuracy is intended or required. The primary and broader purpose of the 1930 illustration was to express that all astronomical observations of so-called stellar areas are products of the inescapable lens deceptions which must be duplicated in every detail in telescopic observation and photography of luminous outer sky surface areas of the Earth. Realization of lens deceptions in the sky over our own backyard eloquently proves that telescopic observations of the celestial deal only with unrounded and connected celestial sky surface areas. And it is the individual concept which mistakenly bestows the status of globe on celestial sky surface areas after the detecting lenses provided the area with a disk appearance. 
There should be great need for stressing this factor after 300 years of mathematical astronomy, which, in detecting some and conjecturing other luminous surface areas of the celestial sky, has developed the dictum extraordinary that the disk area of lens production is actually the globe which concept harbors. To avoid possibility of misunderstanding this paramount feature dealing with illusion and delusion, it may be further clarified as follows. The unreal globe, which was sired by the unreal disk because the lens alone was responsible for the disk, is astronomically established as a factual entity in the world of things. Is it not astounding? Fortunately, current rocket camera photographs of luminous outer terrestrial sky surface areas make it possible for the first time in history to check and compare astronomical observations. That checking and comparing was denied to telescopic observation for many centuries, and it has since been denied to astronomy's hired assistants, telescopic photography and spectroscopic analysis. However, it has now proved the complete fantasy of isolated globes or spheres circling or ellipsing in space, though the unprecedented opportunity for checking and comparing assumed conditions of celestial finding with factual conditions of terrestrial finding is now available to astronomy. It is questionable if the astronomical fraternity will take advantage of it. We see only that which we want to see, and we believe no more than that which we want to believe. Hence, primed observations are as dubious as spies. Nevertheless, though primed observations may be known to be so untrustworthy, such primed observations are retained as companions because that seems to be the easiest course. To reject them would impose an effort and a responsibility. Since rocket camera photographs have established that the deceptions of lens function are inescapable, it follows that once the telescopic finding is accepted at its face value, deducing robots instead of human astronomers may as well check the lens findings. What the astronomers may interpret of the telescopic photographic plates becomes entirely irrelevant if the lens error reproduced on the plates is accepted as fact. Alas, the astronomer seems to be painfully reluctant to admit that proof of the error is at hand. It is pertinent to explain that the identical spectrum variations of celestial analysis will be found to apply to luminous outer surface sky areas of the Earth the same misinterpretation of values will ensue. And with realization of the terrestrial sky refactual values, the misinterpretation of celestial values should become manifest. Though terrestrial sky areas are known to be continuous in holding their allotted place in the universe structure, their billowing or fluctuating within the cosmic area of their original construction and placement will be accredited the same fantastic motions astronomically prescribed for the so-called stars and planets of celestial sky areas, when terrestrial sky areas are analyzed from the same distance, and with the same astronomical equipment, their gaseous content and movement will produce all that which celestial sky gas produces for spectrum analysis of terrestrial astronomers. However, from our celestial observatory we would not dream of interpreting the spectrum recordings as astronomers now interpret the recordings from celestial sky areas. With knowledge of our terrestrial sky, we would know better. Thus, returning to the illustrative thousand-mile course of terrestrial skylight illusions, we find that the stratosphere journey from New York City to Chicago at an altitude of 100 miles or more must develop the following observational and photographic conclusion, the deceptively globular and develop the following observational and photographic conclusion, the deceptively globular and isolated luminous sky areas would require seeing the planet of New York City. Then, in the order designated, there would be seen the star of Albany and the planets or stars of Utica, Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo. Then, at an angle from the main line of perpendicular observation over the cities of New York State would be observed the star of Erie, Pennsylvania. As the course continued toward Chicago, there the planets of Cleveland and Detroit would loom. Other vague star scatterings would be observable in all directions away from the direct course being photographed on the perpendicular. The 3,000 mile area of the luminous terrestrial sky would present the same deceptive appearance and the sky areas would show corresponding celestial sky variations of luminosity due to variations of the chemical content 
and gaseous activity of the respective terrestrial sky areas. Though this may be repetitious, it should here be explained that the familiar blue sky's varying depth or blueness, observable from time to time and from place to place at the same time, actuates variation of the outer sky's luminosity. The following feature also serves as an agent for the less developed illusions of record. The torrid equatorial and the frigid Arctic and Antarctic sky areas would be shown to possess marked difference in the depth of their luminosity when compared with the luminosity of temperate zone sky areas. That would mean very little if the universe whole contained but one torrid and two frigid zones as now known at terrestrial level. However, the zones of the terrestrial are duplicated over and over again throughout the universe whole. That factor influences difference in light waves and colors now registered from luminous sky areas of the celestial, which are otherwise of the same composition. Corresponding differences, for corresponding reasons, would be shown to develop from terrestrial sky areas. Were we to increase the 100 mile altitude to 5,000 miles, the sky area of the illustrations course from New York City to Chicago would loom as a white layer of stars. Then, as our telescope was adjusted at an angle for observation of the sky territory, northeast of New York City, there would be detected sky area stars of Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. The number of stars, star clusters, and double stars to be detected over that sky area would depend on land's power and other conditions previously described. The extent of our stratosphere search for terrestrial sky stars could continue over the Atlantic Ocean beyond Boston. Stars detected at such points would represent the rim of the terrestrial stars area, first detected at New York City, and detection of stars would not be restricted to a direct eastern area. As it embraced the area from New York City to Boston in an easterly direction, it would also embrace a wide area in a northerly direction to the Canadian border and south to the Gulf of Mexico. Under telescopic observation, some sky areas would become vaguer, while others of the same area would be more luminous. The more luminous might appear at the Atlantic Ocean rim, and the vaguest might be detected in nearby Connecticut.